So uh, I want to give you skills for the holidays. Okay, holidays are coming up. You will have abundant amount of food in front of you. You're going to find it hard to resist. So I'm going to teach you skills in which you will reduce your hunger, you will increase your satiety, you will have control over the food that you're going to eat. Isn't that amazing to have control over something that you'd say, I don't have the desire to eat that. Right. So the way I'm going to do that is by teaching you the basics of how our body derives energy. You know, for day-to-day -day life, we need energy. Energy makes us move, energy makes us think, energy maintains our muscle mass. If we have good muscle tone, we have good quality of life because we are able to move. The basic question that comes about is that how does the body burn fuel to get energy? So let's see, we'll pick up carbohydrates. When we say carbohydrates, whether you're eating tubers, whether you're eating whole grains, you're eating sugar, the body is going to convert it into glucose in everyone. So let's say you eat 400 grams of carbohydrates. 400 grams is a pound of carbs. And average American eats over 400 grams of carbs. Okay? So how much carbs can a body store in the body? Like let's say I eat 400 grams. How much of that can I store? What happens to that carbohydrate? It's in the grams area. You're right. So. We can store only 100 grams of carbs in the liver. And that is called glycogen. So our ability to store carbohydrate is limited. So when you eat carbs, what happens to the carbs? So I have put together here a cell. This is a generic cell. And the place where the body burns that fuel, what is that called? The engine of the cell. So it's called the mitochondria. So you guys know that. So sugar enters the cell, gets converted through a series of chemical reactions before it gets into the engine. So if I can enlarge the engine out here, every molecule, whether it is fat or whether it is sugar, Whatever it is, in order to provide energy, so sugar as well as fat, will get converted before it enters the mitochondria into what is called acetoacetate. You don't need to remember that, but it's a small molecule called acetoacetate. Okay? So this acetoacetate is taken up by the mitochondria, which is the engine, and it is put through a series of chemical reactions. And when it is put through a series of chemical reactions, it is burning and it creates energy. So when you're burning fuel, you get horsepower. You get mechanical energy, which is called horsepower. What is the energy currency of the body? Not important to know, but interesting to know that it's called ATP. Okay? So whether it is sugar or carbohydrates, or it is fat, the body will turn that into this small molecule, which is called acetoacetate, before it burns it into chemical energy, which is called ATP. So let's say I'm eating, like an ordinary American, about 400 grams of carbs, or let's say I'm taking 100 grams of carbs. And on top of that, I'm eating 200 grams of fat. Okay, so I'm eating both carbs and I'm eating both fat. So what will my body burn first? It'll always burn fat, uh, carbohydrates first. It'll never burn fat first. The reason it burns carbs first is because it has no place to store it. It has no place to store the carbs, so it wants to dispose of the carbs. But let's say I am not exercising, and I don't need 400 grams of carbs. So the body finds that it has a large amount of 
this molecule called acetyl-CoA. And so if you imagine that this acetyl-CoA is, is in the small engine, which is the mitochondria, I just enlarged it. In the setting of high sugars, this acetyl-CoA is converted to another compound. And I hate to use many terms, but it's called malonyl-CoA. Okay? And that's the key factor. Because if you're eating too much carbohydrates, you can't burn them. You turn them to malonyl-CoA. And malonyl-CoA does two important things. So malonyl-CoA is the first committed step in our body making fat from carbohydrates. OK? So in other words, if you eat too much carbs and you can't burn it, you convert it to malonyl-CoA which increases the amount of fat that we are producing. And this fat, let's say it's in the liver cell. What does the liver cell do to the fat that it is producing? It can't keep it in it, because otherwise you'll get a fatty liver, so it'll try to get rid of it. How does the liver get rid of the fat in the, uh, that it is producing from carbohydrates? So it puts it in a molecule, which is called VLDL, which is very low density lipoprotein which is the father of LDL. Mm -hmm. And the reason it does that is that that is a water-soluble carrier for the triglycerides. So if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, the liver is converting that carbohydrates to fat. The fat is exported out into the bloodstream. What will happen to your VLDL levels? It'll go up. How does your doctor see elevated VLDL levels? It sees it as high triglycerides. When you measure VLDL, you're measuring triglycerides. So people tell me, Doc, I'm eating no fat. I'm eat basically eating carbs. Why the hell is my triglycerides up? Right? Now you understand why the triglycerides go up when you're eating carbs. OK. Now. I want to bring you to an important concept. And that is that when you look at this mitochondria, this, this uh, engine of the cell, it doesn't take in a fat molecule. So let me say that again. It doesn't take in that fat, fat molecule easily without there being a gatekeeper out there. So in other words, in order to shuttle fat into the engine, there is an enzyme that the body uses, and let's just call it CPT. It has a long name, but let's just call it CPT. So in other words, fat that you eat is taken up into the mitochondria, which is the energy burning cell, part of the cell, by this enzyme. It is transporting it into the engine so that it can burn it. What does malonyl-CoA do to this enzyme. So how, how are you getting high levels of malonyl-CoA? So you are getting malonyl-CoA when you eat a lot of carbs that you cannot burn. And malonyl-CoA is making the fat. But malonyl-CoA does another important thing. It comes and tells this enzyme what? What it does is it comes and tells the enzyme, don't put any fat into the engine because the engine is already full. It doesn't need any more energy. OK? How can you make the CPT functional so that it shuttles fat into the mitochondria? By eating no carbs, right. What is another way of eating no carbs? What is the other way to do it? Fasting. Fasting, OK. So when in the absence of sugar, and in the presence of this enzyme that is working well, fat will get into the engine. And this is called fatty acid oxidation. It's called beta oxidation or fatty oxidation. And fat, before it gets burned, gets converted to the same thing, which is acetyl-CoA, that you get from sugar. So it's the same type of molecule that is being burned. So now that you're burning fat, you can only use so much to burn in the liver cell. 
Okay, but the liver is a master regulator of our metabolism. It serves many other functions. So I got to pause here for a minute and ask you, what else can the liver do with the fat that comes into the mitochondria and cannot be burned? The body is very good at doing one thing but not both. So in other words, it can either burn fat or it can make fat. Right. It can't simultaneously burn fat and make fat. Ex excellent. So this is the concept of what is called ketones. So in other words, this acetyl-CoA, you can burn whatever you can burn for your immediate needs. And what you cannot burn is converted through a series of chemical reactions into what is called ketones. So ketones are small molecules. These molecules are derived from breaking down of fat. They are made in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the energy, uh, uh, the energy engine of our body. And the ketones serve a very specific function. What are the properties of ketones? One, they are small molecules. Number two, are they water soluble or no? Yes. So they are water soluble. So in other words, they don't need a protein carrier like VLDL does, like fat does, or like cholesterol does. So they are water soluble. And they function like sugar molecules. So ketones are a surrogate for sugar molecules. So let's say I am somebody who practices both fasting and a low carb diet. So in other words, I'm not really putting any sugar through my mitochondria. I'm just principally burning fat, right? And if I'm burning fat, I'm using that for energy but also making ketones. Where are these ketones used? The brain. Okay, so if you take an ordinary American who's eating just basically a high carb diet, how much of the consumption in the brain is sugar based? In other words, our brain, humans have a massive brain. I don't know if you know that or no, but most mammals, the energy consumption of the brain is less than 5% of the total energy consumption of the body. In humans, because we have this huge brain, our energy consumption is 20% of the energy consumption of the rest of the body. That's a huge amount. In most animals, it's about one to 5%, we are 20%. So in a carbohydrate eating ordinary American, how much of the brain energy use is coming from sugar? So if you're burning carbohydrate, if you're using carbohydrates, you're not going to burn fat just because of what I told you out here. This is a key step that prevents your fat from even entering the mitochondria. And when you're eating carbohydrates, you are in a fat synthesizing mode. You are making fat. You are not going to burn fat. There is another hormonal trigger that we will get into in a little bit. So I have put it out here. Uh, a human that is consuming a high carbohydrate diet is almost entirely burning sugar in the brain. Whereas if you are behaving like somebody from my group, not having carbohydrates and regularly practicing fasting, about two thirds of your energy, two thirds of your brain energy is coming from consuming ketones, which is called beta hydroxybutyrate. So only one third comes from eating, uh, sh uh, one third comes from the brain consuming sugar. Not eating sugar, but the body makes that sugar. We'll get into that in a little bit. What are the benefits of ketones for the brain or for the rest of the body? But for now, let's focus on the brain. Before the advent of drugs that could cure epilepsy and in people with what is called multi-drug resistant epilepsy, 
people who have high levels of beta hydroxybutyrate consumption their epilepsy gets better when you have dementia dementia is a condition in which you lose cognitive skills memory skills does the body does the brain find it hard to use sugar yes it does but it can much better use ketones beta hydroxybutyrate so brain function can improve Parkinson's can improve, depression can improve. Some people swear that bipolar improves a lot when you go on a low carb diet and increase your ketone levels when you're actually in ketosis. All right, so I said that even if you take a Inuit, uh, an Islander from Alaska, or if you take an isolated population that is eating no carbohydrates, the brain is still consuming one third of its energy from carbohydrates. Where does it get that carbs from? So the question is, is that it'll convert some protein to glucose, but it'll also convert a portion of fat to glucose. So if you look at fat, it's called triglycerides, right? It's got three fatty acids plus a glycerol backbone. So it can change, it can use the glycerol backbone to change it into carbohydrates. Through a series of chemical reactions, it can convert acetyl-CoA to carbohydrates, and it can convert protein to carbohydrates. So roughly, it's about a third, third, and a third. A third of the carbohydrates are coming from protein, a third of it are coming from fat, and the third of it are coming from these small molecules. Okay? So, the longer you practice a low carb diet, the less the body is dependent on carbs, the more it can use ketones for various purposes, and the less carbs it needs, and the less protein breakdown there is. Okay, let's say that again. The more you practice a low carb diet, the more you do fasting, the better the body gets at making beta hydroxybutyrate and using it and needing less and less carbs so it's breaking down less and less protein over a period of time. I wanted to get into this thing out here. There's a new concept about cholesterol that I have not discussed with anybody so far, and it is my theory, it is my hypothesis. And so I'd like to present that to you, because previously I had talked about this experiment in which they took a group of people, okay, about eight healthy volunteers, and they said that you cannot eat anything for about eight days. I have shown that slide many times. So eight people were taken, healthy people, and they said all you can have is water and salt, and you cannot eat anything for eight days. At the beginning of the study, they measured their LDL cholesterol. Do you guys know what LDL cholesterol is? Low density. Is that the good or the bad cholesterol? The bad, the bad cholesterol, right? So these guys were on the no food for seven days, water and salt. What do you think happened to their LDL cholesterol at the end of seven days? It went up, right? So how much did it go up by? It was 110 to begin with. How much did it go up to? It went to 190, okay? That was a 70% increase. So LDL cholesterol in the setting of fasting went up by 70%. Good cholesterol went up, triglycerides went down, and LDL cholesterol went up. So why do you think the LDL cholesterol went up is the question. And the way I was answering to my people is that the father of the LDL cholesterol is the VLDL cholesterol. So let me say that again. What happens is that the liver 
is putting out more energy molecule into the bloodstream because you're not consuming any carbs. So it's putting out triglycerides in the form of VLDL. And as the VLDL is dropping off the triglycerides to be used by the cells, it is getting converted to LDL because once the VLDL drops off its triglycerides, it becomes the LDL molecule. Okay, so I don't know if you get that point is that you are trafficking more energy in the bloodstream as fat energy in the form of VLDL. Since you're eating no carbs, you need to traffic more fat energy. And since you're trafficking more fat energy, you will, be, you will have a higher amount of LDL. But the concept is, is that the body is trafficking more VLDL, which is the father of LDL. The VLDL carries the triglycerides. The triglycerides are being used up right away, so the VLDL gets converted to LDL. So whether LDL is the bad cholesterol or no, we should get into in a little bit later. I do not think LDL is necessarily the bad cholesterol. So, but I wanted to tell you that it's, this is a little simplistic and there is disagreement about it. The reason there is disagreement about it is that your liver, in the setting of a high fat diet, when you're consuming a high fat diet, is your liver making triglycerides? It is not, right? Because the triglycerides are being put into the, into the energy, uh, into the engine. And since there is no malonyl-CoA, it is not being converted to triglycerides, so it's not synthesizing triglycerides as much. And since it's not making triglycerides, it will not increase the father of the LDL. So where does the cholesterol come from? Because the cholesterol goes up when you follow a low-carb diet, and the cholesterol goes up when you're doing fasting. That is going to happen to everyone. So where does the cholesterol come from? So the, what's happening is that you're making ketones. This acetyl-CoA gets converted to an intermediate molecule before it becomes ketones. And it is also the first step in cholesterol synthesis. So I don't know why nobody has come up with this yet. But when I was preparing for this talk, I was thinking that the chemical pathways to make ketones, the chemical pathway to make ketones, is the same chemical pathway to make cholesterol. The chemical pathway to make ketones is the same chemical pathway to make cholesterol. So since you're trafficking a lot of fat energy through the engine of the cell, and you're converting the acetyl-CoA to ketones through this intermediate step, you will also make a lot of cholesterol. And when the liver has a lot of cholesterol, it's not going to hang on to it. What is it going to do to that cholesterol it has made? It is going to put it into the bloodstream. How is it going to put it into the bloodstream? By making it into an LDL molecule. So if you're following a high fat diet, what is going to happen to your LDL level? It's going to go up. What's going to happen to your triglyceride levels? It's going to go down. What's going to happen to your good cholesterol level? It's going to go up. Okay. Now there is another factor that controls the bad cholesterol in the bloodstream. And that is what is called the LDL receptor. How many of you know what an LDL receptor is? So in other words, there is LDL cholesterol floating around in the bloodstream. How is that LDL removed? It's removed through a receptor. Where is that LDL receptor? The LDL receptor is in the liver. So LDL receptor is there in the river. So in people who do fasting, whose LDL cholesterol is up, what happens to the receptor in the liver? Does it go down? Does the body make less receptors or makes more receptors? Well, does it have a set amount at all times or does it change? It changes. Oh, it change. Everything is in dynamic equilibrium in our body. So it would increase. So you would think it would increase, right? But it shouldn't because the liver already has too much cholesterol. 
because you're making a lot of ketones, because you have all of these precursors, you're not only making ketones, but you're making a lot of cholesterol in the liver. The liver is dumping the cholesterol into the bloodstream as LDL, and it has no need to pick up that cholesterol. It doesn't have need to pick up that cholesterol. So what is going to happen to the LDL receptor? It's going to go down. So studies have shown that when you go on to a low carb diet, or when you're fasting, the liver takes up less of the LDL back because it's already making too much uh, cholesterol. Okay, now I want to kind of go through a very important concept out here and that concept is like this. Let's say I have been eating carbs like an ordinary American and I stop eating carbs. How long do the carbs last in my bloodstream? Remember we said that our body can store only about 100 grams of carbs. Right? right? How long do you think that the carbs will last in our bloodstream? <coughs> yeah, let's say I've been consuming a standard American diet. My liver has 100 grams of carbs. I not now stopped eating carbohydrates. And I say I'm going to go on to a fast. I'm not going to eat anything. So you're going to burn through the 100 grams of carbs in about two hours two to four hours. So what's going to happen at the end of two to four hours when you burn through the carbs? You're going to start becoming hungry. But it makes no sense, right? Because you stopped eating carbs, you have run out of glycogen, no carbs is entering into the engine of the body. Why doesn't the body pick up the burning of the fat? Why is the body not picking up the burning of the fat and converting them to energy or converting them to ketones. So this was a very good answer out here about hormones. But let's say hormones are less, we, let's, not, let's suspend that for a minute. We'll, we'll get back to the hormones. So the body has a very cruel trick on us. Because if you look at the levels of ketones, so in other words, the ketones that are required by your brain. Your brain will say, I have no sugar, I am dependent on sugar, please supply me with sugar and please go and eat. Okay? Because the body has done a cruel trick. How long does it take? Let's say I'm a carb dependent person and I stop eating carbs. I stop eating carbs. How long does it take for my ketones to go up? So it, the initial rise is in three hours, but the more sustained rise is at about 13 hours. So, the, so you guys, when you go home, you got to remember that. So like anything, like a marathon or like any skill you're learning, tennis or whatever, fasting is a skill. And when you learn that skill and you go through the first 13 hours, that is when your ketone bodies go up and you will be less hungry at 13 hours than you are at three hours. Why is that? You start using ketones, okay? So if I take somebody who is a carb eating person and I measure the levels of their ketones, how much ketones they are? I can't write out here, but let's, let's say if I can pretend to write up here. Okay, so the uh, Europeans are in the habit of measuring stuff in millimoles. So ketones are measured in millimoles. So if I take an ordinary American who's eating a carb diet, their ketone levels are less than 0 0.1 millimoles. So that's nothing. That's nothing. When you go through a 13 hour fast is when the levels of this go to about 1 millimole. If you do a two week fast, how much do you think the levels of the ketones will go to? In a, about five millimoles. Where is this energy coming from? Where is the ketone energy coming from? From stored fat. So you made an important point, right? And the important point is that 
it is dependent on hormones why is the ketone levels not going up right away why is it not going up immediately the reason it's not going up immediately is that if the fat cells are exposed to a hormone they refuse to release the fat into the bloodstream if the fat cells are exposed to a certain hormone they refuse to release the fat into the bloodstream and what is that hormone insulin. that's insulin so how much do you need to drop that insulin so if I take a person who is consuming carbs and who like a standard American is about uh, got a BMI of 30 and I check their fasting insulin levels it's usually between 10 and 30 how much does that insulin level need to go down to before the fat cells will say hey we're going to release fatty acids into the bloodstream for ketone production it's less than five it's less than five does it happen in the first day you say you have body mass index of 30 you're a little heavier does it happen in the first day it does not happen in the first day does it happen in the second day no it doesn't it takes about one week of a low carb diet along with you know time restricted feeding which is called fasting before your body starts reducing insulin levels before your body releases the fatty acids into the bloodstream before those fatty acids get converted to ketones so people practicing a low carb diet or people practicing fasting are not going to find immediate relief in the first day it takes seven days at the end of seven days when your ketone levels are one to two millimoles with low carb diet and with periods of fasting how is your energy level going to be the energy level is going to be very high why is it going to be high because you have plenty of fat you're, you're burning the fat that you have accumulated and that's why people who go on a low carb diet and who are practicing intermittent fasting on a regular basis their energy levels are higher during fasting than immediately after eating you're going to feel better with fasting than you're going to feel after you eat let's talk about one other important concept and that important concept is that how long should you fast is it good to fast for several days in a row so let's talk about it what are the dangers of long-term fasting so electrolyte problems is one that's an important thing that can cause an issue at a specific time we'll get to that what is the other danger of long-term fasting muscle loss protein loss why do you get protein loss with so exactly the body needs to make sugar and one third of the sugar production in the body and in initially even half of the sugar production in the body is dependent on breaking down your muscles to make that sugar so you can lose up to one fourth to half a pound of muscle per fasting day in the beginning and that's the reason why I would not want people to do long-term fasting okay so that's why we are against it what is the best duration of fast okay so we say 18 hours why is the duration of fast 18 hours the best because the reason is that if you look at the increase in ketone levels the highest peak happens at about 13 hours so you start making ketones so that makes you move fat energy if you look at the reduction in insulin levels 70 percent of reduction in insulin levels is happening by about 18 hours so you're getting most of the benefit of fasting by doing an 18 hour fast and you're not getting any of the detriment of fasting in terms of breaking down muscle so let's say you guys have been here you heard about ketone bodies you've heard about the energy cell you've heard about triglycerides and you say I'm gonna go and start practicing fasting and you're gonna fast for 18 hours and we say in our group we say eat your first meal at noon and your last meal at 6 p.m. 
noon to 6 p.m. eating, okay? And don't eat from 6 until the next noon. Now this is an important aspect. What should you eat? Somebody said protein, somebody said fat. Okay, so what I would say is that if you are in a weight losing situation, you say, you, I want to lose weight, then what you do is you focus on eating high quality protein. The reason you want to eat high quality protein is because you want to replace the protein loss that you've had because some of your protein is broken down to make sugar right because sugar is obligately needed by our brain at least even in the person who is practicing a low carb diet with fasting only two thirds of the energy is coming from ketone bodies the one third is coming from glucose and the body is going to make that glucose by burning protein so instead of losing that protein if you want to lose weight you are going to want to eat high quality protein. Okay, so let's talk about what is high quality protein. Grass fed beef, lamb, chicken, pork, fish, shrimps, eggs. Okay, so what you do is that you eat about at least 100 grams of proteins. You say, well, I'm not, if I'm, let's say if I have a body mass index of 30 and I'm doing fasting, and at the end of 13 hours, my ketone levels are 3. Am I going to be hungry? So many people who are heavy, who practice fasting, say, I go about the entire day and I'm really not hungry if they're doing that, if they're doing this very well. If they're doing fasting and low carb very well, they don't feel hungry. You have to force them, they would have to force themselves to eat. And if they are forcing themselves to eat, they should not eat a lot of fat. Why should they not eat a lot of fat? Because this fat that they are burning through the engine should not come from the fat that you have eaten, but should come from the fat that you have stored. On the other hand, you don't want to bring this sugar from your muscles. You want to repair your muscles because the muscles that are broken down to give sugar are repaired by the protein that you eat. So the people who are heavy, who want to lose weight, should do what is called protein sparing fasting. So they should eat at least 100 to 150 grams of protein depending on their weight. Now you can't eat 100 to 150 grams of protein by itself. So you would have add a little fat to make it flavorful. Okay. On the other hand, if you're slim like Chana is, or like any of my MAs out here, you need to put in fat. Otherwise, you would feel really bad. You would have no energy because you're continually losing weight. You need to supply this fat, not just from the fat cells, but from the fat that you are eating. So what you eat in that six hour window depends on whether you are heavy, whether you need to lose weight or whether you don't need to lose weight but you want to maintain a healthy metabolism which is fat based. Alright, so when you are eating protein, let's just talk a little bit about protein. When you are eating protein, when should you eat your protein? Let's say many people are wanting to eat a lot of salad, fiber. When should you eat the protein part of your meal? In that six-hour period, you mean? Right. Okay. So in other words, should you eat all the salad first and then protein next? No, protein Why do you want to eat the protein first? The reason you eat the protein part of the meal first is because you need stomach acid to break down the protein. If you eat a lot of fiber first, you will dilute the stomach acid and you will not absorb the protein well. What happens to stomach acid as we get older? Less it decreases. So how should you prepare your meats as you get older? Can you eat a raw piece of steak, sushi, <laughs> and other things as you get older? As you, you can, but there's a greater likelihood that you will get sick 
and there's a greater likelihood that you will not benefit from it. And the reason for that is that one of the functions of stomach acid is what? To break down meat. It's to break down meat. Yes, I agree with that. Right. You first, so you will not. So in people who don't make stomach acid, and older people make less stomach acid, you will not break down the meat. But nothing bad will happen from not breaking down the meat. But what bad can happen from the meat that you eat that is uncooked is that one of the primary purposes we have stomach acid is to neutralize the bacteria in the food that we eat. <coughs> you heard recently that romaine lettuce had a lot of infections. And the reason is, is that our stomach acid will see the bacteria and it will kill it. But as we get older, the stomach acid goes down. So you will be less tolerant to meat and to sushi and to vegetables that have a higher content of bacteria, you will get infections from that. So that's why people who have low stomach acid should cook their vegetables, should cook their meat a little bit to tenderness so that they don't have to depend on stomach acid to absorb it. What is another common situation in which people have their stomach acid go to zero? Acid blocking drugs. What are acid blocking drugs? Nexium, Prilosec, Protonic. So if you're on these acid blocking drugs, you're going to make zero stomach acid. In that situation, you've got to be very careful about eating anything raw because you don't have stomach acid to neutralize the bacteria. You also cannot eat raw meat because you need meat that is well cooked so that you can absorb it. Uh, by the way, let's address one other factor before we get that. You said multi-day fasting has, is associated with electrolyte problems, right? So when do you get those electrolyte problems mostly? The, you get the electrolyte problems with refeeding. When you start re when you start eating again, the electrolytes get suddenly depleted because they get into the cells with the food that you eat, and you can get low potassium levels, low magnesium levels, low phosphorus levels. So long-term fasting, multi-day fasting should never be done without medical supervision. Also, when you're doing regular fasting, the 18, uh, 16 to 18 hour fasts, what do you need to be careful about? You need to be careful about drinking fluids. What type of fluids should you drink? So water alone is not enough. You may need to add some salt to it. The best salt to add would be a little bit of Himalayan pink salt. Okay. What else should you have? Should you consider having when you are doing intermittent fasting on a regular basis? Is to have bone broth. Why is bone broth necessary? Because bone broth supplies some very important minerals, magnesium, calcium, sodium, that would help the fasting process a lot by replenishing these electrolytes. All right, so I wanted to end by talking about what are markers of good health. When we see a person and they're following a low carb diet and they're following fasting, how can we tell that they are in good health? What are the things that we measure to tell that you are in good health? So I put it on the board out there, and before you guys go, you can take a picture of that. A marker of good health would be preservation of muscle mass. That is very important. Why is muscle mass important? Muscle mass is important because it gives us mobility. It gives us the quality of life that we need. So preserving muscle mass in the setting of fasting and low carb diet is essential and important and there are two ways to pr preserve it. One is that you eat high quality protein and absorb it. The second way to preserve your muscle mass is to be physically active. So that is one of the most important things. Physical activity will improve your muscle mass, okay? Now, the second marker of good health is the health of your fat tissue. This is something that very few people understand. So the quality, adipose tissue is called your fat tissue. The health of your fat tissue is dependent on what? It is dependent on their ability to take in 
the triglycerides and store them. So let me say that again. When I eat fat, if I eat fat, I can use only a certain amount of that fat to burn as energy. I don't want to leave that fat energy in the bloodstream. Because leaving fat energy, triglycerides in the blood, bloodstream is detrimental for us. That fat gets into the liver, it gets into the heart, it gets into the blood vessels. So the person who's got healthy fat tissue is one in which the fat cells are empty. The fat cells are empty and when you eat fat, the body is capable of packing the fat into the fat cells. So in other words, the fat cells are, are shrunk, they are smaller in size, and many in number. And so you are not leaving any triglycerides in the bloodstream, but you are packing it into the fat cells after you eat. A sumo wrestler is healthy, even though they are 600 pounds because they pack the fat energy that they eat into the fat cells and leave none of it in the bloodstream. 30% of severely heavy people are metabolically healthy because their fat cells are healthy. They eat the fat and pack it into the fat cells. It's just nature's way of design, designing people who could survive long periods of having no food. So because if nature designed everybody to be slim and trim, then we would not have survived periods in which there was food scarcity. So it designed people that had fat tissue that could accept a lot of fat and not leave fat hanging in the bloodstream. So when I said I'm like a toffee, if I get 10 pounds heavier, my fat cells will get a lot more unhealthy compared to somebody who is 300 pounds because their fat cells are healthier by design. So that's an important concept. So you need to find out whether you have healthy fat tissue. How do you find that out? Is there a surrogate marker of finding out whether you have healthy fat tissue? And the way you find that out is by finding out whether your body is inflamed. Inflammation markers. So CRP is one of them. I've written it out there. GGT is another one of them. Third one would be ferritin. A fourth easy one is to look at triglycerides. If your triglycerides are high, then you would know that your fat tissue is not very healthy. A fourth way of knowing is something called adiponectin. Adiponectin is a hormone that regulates the amount of fat that is released into the bloodstream. And abnormal fat cells have altered levels of adiponectin. So we can measure adiponectin in certain laboratories. What are some of the other surrogate blood markers that you're looking at? You want to look at your HDL levels. If your HDL levels are high, it's an indication that you're metabolically healthy. What about LDL levels? In somebody who is following a low-carb diet and fasting, are high LDL levels necessarily bad? No, they are not. A person who is metabolically healthy will have low sugars in their bloodstream or high sugars? Low sugars. What about insulin levels? Will it be low or high? Low. We already talked about inflammation markers. We said that we should have normal vitamin D levels. And an important indicator of health is having normal stomach acid because normal stomach acid lets you absorb protein, lets you absorb calcium, neutralizes the bacteria in the food that you eat and keeps you healthy. That's why I am against prescribing PPIs and acid blocking drugs indiscriminately without being carefully evaluated to see if you need them or not. So the question is, is that on the days that you're fasting, if you're taking medications, especially diabetic medications, blood pressure medicines, supplements, should you take them in the morning or should you wait until the time you start eating? My advice is to wait until the time you start eating because especially with diabetic medications, especially with blood pressure medicines, you may not need them at that time. Yes, sir. <coughs> So 
So that is a loaded question. Um, so uh, not as much as we think. So like in, in other words, we used to prescribe, we used to say always buy grass fed, don't buy grain fed. We no longer say that. And I would recommend that I have a YouTube video which says a tribute to Peter Ballerstad. I want you to, I recommend that you watch that. Because the quality of meat between a grain fed and a grass fed, the difference is so minimal that I don't think it is worth the price difference, especially if you are on a low budget. So I would not say that you get such a tremendous health benefit by eating grass fed that grain fed would not provide you with that benefit. So yes, you please don't make that mistake. I would say cutting out the refined carb, cutting out the refined sugar will give you a lot more benefit than the difference between grass and grain fed. So the question is, is that in multi-day fasting, do you have, will you have protein breakdown always because people who are necessarily heavy, they have a lot of fat. Fat is triglycerides. Triglycerides is three fatty acids coupled to a glycerol molecule. Isn't that enough to supply all the sugar that I need for my brain? And why do I need to eat protein? Is that the question? Kind of. Kind of. So the answer to that is that studies after studies have shown and these are studies done by some very, very good physicians in the 50s and 60s. And they continue to this day and they say that you will have at least a quarter pound to one eighth pound of lean muscle mass loss from protein breakdown to generate sugar when you do, when you do multi-day fasting. In the beginning, the lean mass is greater, but as time goes got down, the lean mass goes down, but it never goes to zero. So you would never be able to completely supply the glucose needs from burning fat, from converting fat to glucose. You will convert some protein to sugar. So that's the reason why I'm against multi-day fasting without replenishing protein. So I say you need to do a protein sparing modified fast and replace all the electrolytes. That's, the, I think, the healthier way of doing it rather than going seven days without eating or, or longer without eating. Yes, go ahead. Well, I, didn't, I didn't go through the coagulation markers, but what we have found is that uh, the reason for getting heart disease is not necessarily high LDL cholesterol. We think that there are certain coagulation markers that our body makes. Um, some of them are LP little a, some of them is homocysteine, some of them is fibrinogen. And high coagulation markers lead to heart disease. And some of the coagulation markers are regulated through the same things that by which you reduce inflammation. So they respond to what you eat, they respond to fasting. So a person with normal levels of coagulation markers, in our, in our opinion, is healthier than a person with high levels of coagulation markers. High level of coagulation markers are people who are at risk of heart disease. So if that answers your question. So let me repeat those questions. The questions is that when you go on a keto diet, uh, you would get less potassium, less magnesium. Should, we be, should you be replacing those? So in a way, yes, uh, because we recommend that you switch from regular table salt to Himalayan pink salt. You'll get enough potassium, enough magnesium on a regular basis, especially if you're following an uh, animal-based protein diet. So in other words, your protein is from animal sources predominantly. So I don't advise magnesium or potassium supplements other than what you are eating, to most people, the only exception that we make is that we advise people with palpitations, with irregular heartbeats, with skip beats, to consider taking magnesium because that will help reduce the palpitations. But on a regular person, I would not waste money by taking magnesium. 
Now your other question related to genetic testing is that there are genetic tests and you want to get these genetic tests done to see what type you are. I would say in the low carb community that I have followed over the last several years, there have been no proponents that I trust that say this genetic testing is necessary. The question, the first question was calcium. Uh, do I recommend calcium supplementation? So I specifically recommend no calcium supplementation. I specifically recommend no calcium supplementation because we are very big on measuring vitamin D levels. If you have normal levels of vitamin D and the only other supplement that we recommend is that you take vitamin K2 because vitamin D and vitamin K2 work in conjunction with each other. We have a whole YouTube video that is dedicated to vitamin D, vitamin K2 that you should watch. So if you have normal levels of vitamin D, you will absorb all the calcium that you need from food itself. You will absorb all the calcium unless you are taking a proton pump inhibitor and abolishing all the stomach acid. If you're not doing that, then yes, you should not take any calcium because calcium taken by mouth in women, in postmenopausal women, in some studies has shown to increase the risks of heart disease. So my advice is that unless you have osteoporosis, osteopenia, and you cannot negotiate with your doctor that, hey, I want to keep normal levels of vitamin D, I want to keep, I want to take vitamin K2, I want to be physically active, and you please follow my bone mass through IDEXA scanner and see what it does rather than giving me calcium supplements. That's the way I would behave. Now, the next question was protein supplements. Protein supplements do have a role. All right, guys, sorry for the pause. The simple answer to the question about protein supplements is that there may be only two situations where people need to take protein supplements. One would be if somebody is trying to build muscle as a bodybuilder or an athlete. The second situation may be somebody who is losing muscle mass, an elderly patient losing muscle mass and not being able to ambulate and, and mobility is an issue in them. Those are the two situations in which um, protein supplements may be beneficial. Otherwise, for routine uh, people trying to follow a healthy diet, high quality animal protein that is well cooked is all that one would require. If you are a regular person like me, I would say that you would get enough protein from what you eat. You don't need to get protein from supplements, protein, protein-based supplements. Thank you. Thank you.